ways of thinking and turn first of all to the theory of uh, Jean Piaget who was interested in how the logic of reasoning affects what we're doing uh, or at least he maintained that thinking itself involved a logic of relationships and that these matured through childhood and that this key to intelligence and thinking is uh, extremely important and the notion of reversibility is what produces our flexibility and thought. You'll remember that we said that communication is a process, that it's ongoing, it's irreversible. Uh, even when you go to sleep, you're sending uh, messages out to the people around you. Well, thinking uh, goes on, may be going on while you're sleeping. You know, the whole notion of dreams is an interesting issue. But uh, this process goes on, and, and thought processes continue. And so Piaget was particularly interested in what happens at these different levels, how uh, thinking itself involves this important relationship, and that the, the key to that thinking is the notion of reversibility and flexibility in thought. And so he gave us different stages of development, which you can see uh, if you're observant and around, whoops, there we go. Uh, at, from birth to about age two is called the sensory motor stage. And this is where the infant is, is learning the concrete use of symbols. Or, I said that backwards, but the symbol use itself is concrete. They really don't understand things that are abstract. Water, mommy, daddy, dog, uh, visible things in the immediate environment that can be seen. And you know that they're moving to a different level of uh, thought ability when they're able to understand things that are not in the present context. If they can remember what it's like to take a trip to grandma's house, to take a trip to see grandpa, if they can remember going to the zoo, uh, if they can remember the train on the railroad tracks when they're not there looking at it. Uh, that's a different level of cognitive development and, and it's the beginning of that abstract process that exists. From age two up until about age seven or eight, they are in the pre-operational stage and, and that's that point where they've learned to separate themselves from the environment around them. They're coming to know the difference between the symbol and the object, but they're still not at a point where they're able to generalize about things. They, they know that uh, you know, people have names and the, a particular name goes with a particular person or an animal and that this dog is not the same as that dog and our pet is not the same as the neighbor's pet but all of those things um, have to be categorized and and sorted out but there's not a broad level of generalization that's going on there. Between about age 8 and 12 this is when concrete operations develop. Uh, the notion of reversibility and relational thinking takes place and there's a greater ability uh, to develop hypothetical thought. Uh, those of you who've watched Mr. Rogers for years may remember, uh, however much you did or did not love him, uh, may remember the sequence about what comes next and the character, you know, somebody drops a banana peel on the floor and a second person comes walking along and is about to step on that banana peel. And so posing the question what comes next would lead you to the conclusion of a high probability of someone falling down and so forth. Well this, this ability to think hypothetically to uh, move to a concrete operation of thought is a measure of how the individual's thought processes are moving along, how the sophistication in that mentally, uh, in the mental process of thinking has progressed. 
The most sophisticated level is formal operations. And this takes place about age 12 up into adulthood. <laughs> Some people never get there. But this is where the individual is able to manipulate purely abstract symbols. And in order to do math or philosophy or any of the higher order uh, thinking activities, this reversibility is required in order to do that. So one of the ways that they measure uh, where the child is in this reversibility process is to do that uh, example that you've probably seen done somewhere before of uh, taking two beakers with water or one with water one without and uh, taking the, the beaker that's almost full that's tall and slender and telling the child I'm going to pour that water into the one over here which is wider, flatter, you and I know the volume is the same. But if the child has not, or the individual, has not developed reversibility yet, then they will believe that when you pour the water from the taller container into this one, that it's going to overflow. Now, one way you can check yourself on this, uh, how, good at you, how good are you at picking the right container for your leftovers? You know, you got all these leftovers from dinner. Can you pick just the right piece of plasticware to put that away and just have the lid fit on? Or is there always too much space or not enough space and you get a bad fit? Well, if you're really good at matching, not that anybody cares that much, but if you're really good at matching that up, then you have a good sense of reversibility. You can look at this space over here and see that it's equivalent to that. Well, that leads on to then higher order thinking in which you're able to deal with uh, algebra problems and, and higher order. But, you know, we don't teach algebra unless it's very simple, A plus B equals C. Uh, we don't teach these higher order subjects to children in second and third, fourth grade, usually, unless we have really bright folks there, because until this idea of reversibility has developed until this abstract thinking has taken place or is possible, we have examples that it's taken place, then the child is not, the person is not ready to move on to that more formal thought. And these stages identified by Piaget have held for a number of years. Now it, it seems to be a very solid theory. Okay, this thought process then, assuming we've accomplished reversibility and that we are capable of abstract hypothetical thinking, uh, fits into what John Dewey described as the reflective thinking approach. Because he said Dewey observed and realized, recognized, that a great deal of our thought involves problem solving, whether it's how to get from point A to point B, and that takes us back to systems theory and equifinality. How am I going to enter college and graduate, change degrees? How am I going to get from the University of Houston to the Galleria if there are traffic jams in this area or that problem or the other? Um, I don't have enough money, whoever does, I don't have enough money to pay for all the things I want to do, so how am I going to solve that problem? Uh, I can't afford gasoline anymore. Am I going to walk, buy a bicycle? Uh, all kinds of problem-solving activities are necessary and, and reflect particularly our culture. Uh, we'll go back to our Eskimos again, and, and I'm really not trying to pick on them. It just happens to be where the example comes, comes from. There's a story in one of my old nonverbal communication textbooks, and I didn't look up the site, but, but the story goes like this, that, that there was uh, an Eskimo tribe that typically ate caribou and followed the caribou herd around, and, and that was their primary means of sustenance uh, during the cold winter months. But the tribe nearly died out because there was a bad winter, uh, many of the caribou died, and there was not enough food to go around 
to, you know, sustain all the people who needed it. So uh, the people died. Well, now, Western thought and, and most of our training would say, well, why did they eat something else? I don't know, and maybe this is just a story. But our, our thought process would say, we've got a problem. Let's look for a solution to that problem. Let's see what kind of alternatives we have, what kind of options we have. You know, it may be that we need to ration the food, we need to eat berries, we need to go fishing. Uh, but surely we have some options here so that not everyone is under the same plight. Well, Dewey recognized that there's an ordered sequence of steps that lead to a good conclusion. And whether this is often used in group discussion classes uh, as well, as just as a, a discussion of the general thought processes for problem solving. And he recognized five basic steps in this process, and, and these apply whether this is uh, a group trying to solve a problem, or whether it's an individual trying to solve a problem. The, the solving sequence is the same in either situation. He calls step one suggestion, but basically you have to identify the problem. Is the problem crowded traffic? Is the problem uh, low retention rate of students? Is the problem students bringing weapons to school? Is the problem inadequate city revenues, you know, you got, the problems are endless. You can always find a problem. Okay, intellectualization, that one's a mouthful, intellectualization, which means careful definition of the problem. And in many cases, this involves some research. You may need to investigate to find out what's causing the problem, what the effects of the problem are, or sometimes you just know uh, your car has died and you can't get to school, and that's no big discovery uh, <clears throat> to figure that out. Okay, what kind of alternatives do you have? Formulation of hypothesis, he called it, but we could translate that to say, uh, what kind of options are available to you? a calculation of the possible solutions. And sometimes there'll be two or three possible solutions. Other times it's a very long list. Uh, or at least there are a number of possible alternatives that you need to uh, figure out. Sometimes brainstorming is used to help generate the list of options that are available. You may find yourself sitting down with a pencil and paper, just making a list of possible alternatives. Okay, step four is reasoning. What are the advantages and the disadvantages are the consequences? They're, they're not always advantages or disadvantages. Uh, but what are the consequences of a particular solution? If, if we pick this option, what kinds of things are likely to happen. If we pick another option, what are the pros and cons of that? And so you work your way through uh, those possible alternatives, and sometimes you even go to, step five can be, well, step five is testing. It may be preliminary testing, like the automobile manufacturers may test a number of models before they actually put something on the market. Other times, the testing involves uh, actually implementing something like putting fluoride into the water or implementing the first phase of a mass transit rail system and seeing the consequences of the solution that's been selected. So. You come up with an idea, you research it, and again, whether this is individual or group, it doesn't matter. 
the steps are the same, and these are fundamental to that thinking process. And these help you reach those alternatives and examine those alternatives. When we get uh, to the group discussion section of our discussion in here, we will we'll look at some uh, other variations on that. Let's see. That's not the one I want. But for right now, I want us to stay focused on meaning and uh, how, how we develop meaning. And, and we're still at the intrapersonal level of communication because there's a lot that goes on in our heads. And uh, we're, we're going to focus on that more at this point and also see how uh, Boulding's notion of the image lays the framework for our paradigm or view of the world, and this is going to lead us on into narrative theory and some other things a little later on. May not get to those today, but we will shortly. <clears throat> okay. We all have images or views of the world, and uh, the word ethnocentrism has been used, and I don't have that on the slide, but uh, the word ethnocentrism has been used to describe what people do because we all see the world from our own point of view. Uh, we'll come to the notion of perception later on, but perception is in the mind of the receiver. Uh, that takes us back to the definition of communication. You know, did communication take place? Well, what did you perceive in this particular event? How do you see the world? Do you see the world as flat or round? Do you see the glass as half full or half empty? All of these are images of the world. When we get to the uh, mass communication unit, the last unit, uh, we'll pick up a, a concept more seriously there. I'll just mention it now. It's called mean world syndrome. And if all you do, if, if the only news you get is the news uh, you know, the 6 o'clock, 10 o'clock news, this sort of thing. Uh, whether it's from television news reports or whether it's from newspaper, print journalism, you may come to believe that the world is a very mean place. And you, because of, of the limited exposure that you have to things. Well, the, the image notion says that each person has this image or frame of reference of the world. And it's the net effect, it's, it's the bottom line, if you will, of an individual's experiences. It's dynamic and it's in flux. We are all changing and, and when we get to the uh, semantics section, and anyway, we'll come to a later section where, where we look at how things are indexed and dated and and change over time. But our view of the world is, is a product of all these experiences that we have. I have a, an acquaintance that lives in rural Nebraska. Okay, They don't lock their doors. They don't lock their windows. They can sleep with the windows open at night. I guess they don't have bats and mosquitoes with West Nile virus and so on. Uh, but you know, their level of security home security is much lower than it is in Houston because their perception of the world is that it's a, it's just it's a safer place and their neighbors are trustworthy. One of my daughters lived in Anchorage, Alaska for a while and when I went up to visit and she did, you know we were getting out going in places and things she never locked the car and I said you just got to go off and leave your car unlocked and she said, yeah, nobody's going to steal it, Mom. And I said, how do you know that? And she said, because if they stole it, where would they take it? You know, the police would find it in a very short period of time, probably a matter of hours at most. There's only one road, real road, highway, in and out of town. There, there's no place to go with a stolen car. Well, that's, that's a very different view of the world, right? You go off and leave your cars unlocked? I don't. 
and I, I lock it as soon as I get in it, close the door and lock it. And as soon as I get out, I lock it. So th this notion of the image of the world, the early label, the image, came from Boulding. Uh, a little later on, we'll get to Jesse Delia and constructivism, which is a, a more detailed and, and um, updated version of this theory, if you will. Okay, different things happen when we perceive an image. Or, I didn't say that right. When, when a message hits our image of the world, uh, there are different effects that that message can have. Sometimes there's no effect at all. And again, when we get to uh, mass theory, we'll look at how media messages do or don't affect people because sometimes they just serve as reinforcers. Other times we do exactly what our favorite commentator is telling us to do. <clears throat> to evacuate an area or not. And we'll look at some causes for that much later on. Uh, but when, when a message hits our image of the world, uh, one possible outcome is that nothing happens. It just kind of bounces off. But additions to the image may occur. You know, how many times have you said, I didn't know that. They can do that. I like to watch the, the health channel, the discovery and, and health channels, you know, and you find all these new medical procedures and things that, that are available to you or to people. And some, some of it I know about, other things they're capable of doing that I've never heard of before. Well, those add to my image. Those are additions to my image of the world that we're now able uh, to do this. On the news the, uh, not too long ago, I learned that, that the vaccinations for rabies have changed, okay? And uh, that it, it's, a, it's still not a good process, but it's a better process. Uh, sometimes there are changes in the image, and this is, takes us into the whole area of persuasion, and we'll get there in a later lecture as well. Uh, there, there are messages, we'll get to social judgment theory, which has latitudes and attitude of acceptance and rejection and non-commitment. But the, the message that we receive may be one that, that persuades us to get on an exercise regime, to stop smoking, to stop drinking, to start drinking, to start smoking, to take drugs, to not take drugs, to do this or not do that to visit this location, not visit that location, to give to this cause, not give to that cause. And, and as these changes occur, uh, we're being persuaded, and we'll, we'll look in that unit at the interrelationship of beliefs and values and attitudes, because that's a very complicated, uh, very fundamental but still complicated uh, kind of process. But changes in our image occur and, and these are the results uh, or they occur as a result of the messages that we're exposed to. Sometimes then the other thing that happens is that we're just clarified or confused. That sometimes happens in this class. I can't imagine why. But you know people say I just don't understand this. Now well we won't pick on any particular classes but there were a few I had in college that I wasn't quite sure on the first pass uh, what the professor was talking about. So there are some things that are too sophisticated for us, some things that we've not had the background material uh, sufficient in order to make us receptive uh, to that. But the, the determination of the School of Communication is that this course is good for you and hopefully as a result of your exposure to all these different theories in here, you're going to be in a better spot as you move on. Uh, that this will lay a foundation, that understanding these theories will cause you to be less confused or hopefully not confused at all when you move on to family communication or health communication or uh, media studies, 
what else do we have? Group discussion, interpersonal communication. Many of the units that we have in this particular class actually expand into full de fully developed uh, courses. And that's always a pleasure for those of you who remember this stuff, uh, you know, because I've had people show up in interpersonal class or family class and say, oh, no, we're not talking about that again. Yeah, well, if you remember it, you know, you get a free skate on this one. You're, you're in on a home run or whatever kind of metaphor you want. Oh, to that. But back to bolding and this notion of the image. He said that it's a very special thing to be human, that it, the human gift is to both have an image of the world and to be able to talk about it. And, and that's what sets us apart from all the other animals, for, certainly from plants. But, you know, the animals engage in some sort of signal behavior. And when we get to nonverbal, we'll, we'll look at uh, what it is they're doing and see if we get a little better handle on that. Uh, you know, the dolphins, they're probably talking about what they're talking about. And, you know, they, have, they might be smarter than we are. I don't know. Uh, but it's certainly a very special and unique human gift to be able to both have an image of the world and to be able to talk with each other about that image of the world through our language and through our nonverbal signs. Okay, here comes Dewey again. This is the same John Dewey that we had a minute ago. And he's interested in how we get meaning. You know, he, we first looked at him as part of the thinking process. And so he's just kind of taking that a, a step further or two steps or whatever, however you want to view that. But he looks at the interaction between the person and the environment and says that part of it is shared and part of it is private. And when you think about what words mean to you, you know, what does, what does the color red mean to you? What does blue mean to you? What does ice cream mean to you? Uh, does walking barefoot in clover mean anything in particular to you? Uh, you know what an art gum eraser is? They're not used that much anymore, but I think they're still around. The smell of an art gum eraser means to me first week of school because as a little kid, each year when school started, you got all your new stuff and you always got that really cool art gum eraser. And if you don't know what it is, go in some store and ask and just, you don't have to buy one, just take a sniff. But, but there's an olfactory signal there. There's a smell that's distinct. Remember the smell of new books, okay, of new text, that, that I guess it's the glue smell, the new paper smell. Well, you know, first week of school means all of those smells it also means a little uncertainty because what's the new teacher going to be like? What are the new classmates going to be like? And so on. <clears throat> but there's an interaction between the person and the environment. Some of these things we share with other people. Some of them are private. You know, if somebody ever hit you with an eraser or hit you with an art gum eraser, eraser or not a chalkboard eraser, um, or if you ever ate one and got a stomach ache, or who knows, there, there are all kinds of private experiences that you could have had uh, with this particular object that would cause the meaning to be different for you uh, as compared to someone else. Language is our vehicle for meaning, and that's one of the reasons that you have to learn all these concepts, because you can't communicate very well unless you know the language. And you don't walk around with a list of the terms in your pocket. You know, and, and people don't go, well, wait, wait a minute, uh, there was some guy named Festinger who, who had a concept that applies here. Let me get my list out. Oh yeah, cognitive dissonance. I'm experiencing cognitive dissonance right now because there's a discrepancy between this and that. And, and I thought the test was next week, 
and here you are telling me we're going to take it in the next five minutes. And, and so I have, wait, what was that word? Oh, <laughs> cognitive dissonance. You know, it, the word is either up there in your head for retrieval or it isn't. And our language is how we communicate. So if, if you think about how many new vocabulary words you're having to learn in your college experience, whether you're learning the names of bugs or the names of diseases or the names of parts of equipment or web technology terms or journalism terms or health-related terms. You know, it just goes on and on and on. You're learning vocabulary and you're doing that because we share meaning with each other. When we get to Kenneth Burke, we'll see more of that. But we'll, we're sharing meaning with each other because we're able to understand the words that we exchange. Hopefully, you're understanding what I'm talking about. Hopefully, when you send an email message to me, I'll understand what you're talking about. It will help me if you give me plenty of language, if you tell me which class you're in and give me your last name as well as your first name. You know, there are different levels of detail and so forth. But it's through our language that we share and establish this meaning with one another. The meaning is not intrinsic to the person or the object. The meaning is assigned. And the meaning that you assign may very well be different from the meaning that I assign. And perception is influenced by a person's notion of how she or he thinks they should respond. Now you might be inclined to disagree with that, and you're certainly entitled to. But if you think about that, your perception is influenced by how a person thinks they should respond. If you see something that's really gory gutsy, you're supposed to go, ooh, that is so interesting. Let me see more. Most of the time, we'll say, oh, yuck, gross. I don't want to see that, even though you might be curious. Okay? And I say, I use that as an example because we'll say, ooh, disgusting, gross. I don't want to see that. And then if there's something squashed on the road, if there are a couple of ambulances around an accident, everybody slows down so they can look. They don't want to see it, but they've slowed down so they can look. You know, and there's something about people that they, they'll look at whatever it is that's smashed out there on the road. But, uh, you know, girls have to decide whether they're going to squeal when they see a spider or a caterpillar or whatever. But the meaning is assigned by the individual. And, and you can relate that to foods, you know, and we won't vote for or against here, but what is your reaction to Brussels sprouts, to broccoli, to asparagus, to raw onions, to any of snails, crawdads, crawfish? The meanings vary. Okay, Dewey also gave us the notion of the accumulated mind as part of the minding process. You know, your mind is a whole collection of things. And the perception and meaning and language are all interrelated. Okay, now he said that objects have potential and to some extent have essence. And people <clears throat> vary in their opinion of, of whether or not an object has essence or not. Uh, some theorists think they do, some don't. There, there's something, oh, how can I put this? There, there's a kind of inherent meaning in some objects, other objects like rocks on the bottom of the stream, as far as I know, don't have any particular meaning. But if, if you go out in the garage and you find your old football from junior high, or you find an old pair of shoes, even though these objects are weathered and worn and look nothing like they did when they were new, 
somehow you know that they're yours. You know, oh, it's my old baseball. Oh, it's my old cap, etc. And and so there is something. <laughs> you go back to your 45th class reunion, as I did last fall. Some of the essences we got right, some we didn't. You know, who are you? What, come closer. Let me see that name tag. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and then other people you would spot, whether it's the arch of the eyebrows or the nature of the life. There, there would be something there that immediately clued you in, and, and it was an easy recognition that uh, this was the person you believed it to be. Others, it was a harder task. So, you know, do things have an essence of their own? It's, it's probably more a function of how we have assigned the meaning to those particular things and those objects or items that, that we know so well that we are able to identify them even though they've changed in their external appearance. But our, our meaning derives from the representation of the object or the referent, and, and we're going to see that more when we get to a little triangular model uh, shortly. But, but your mind is just a collection of many of these things. And the symbol is what shapes our experience. The symbol shapes our experience, and a stop sign is an obvious example of that. The stop sign has shaped your experience with traffic. Uh, if you've ever run a stop sign and had a wreck, then the symbol has shaped that experience, and every time you see a stop sign, it's going to create a recollect some type of recollection of that event. Uh, if you've gotten tickets for running stop signs, every time you see a stop sign, that will affect your recollection of that event. You know, there, there may be other symbols from uh, beautiful sunsets to funnel clouds to particular plants or trees in bloom. There are just different things that you've seen that you have associated particular meaning, assigned particular meanings to those. We'll see some more of this when we get to uh, Osgood and the semantic space model, and we'll see even more clearly, I think, in that model that <clears throat> uh, we don't assign meanings the same way and, and that our own experiences and events contribute to those. Now, I've used the term model several times. Let's do a little kind of spot check here and ask yourself, what's the difference between a theory and a concept? What's the difference between a theory and a model? What's the difference? What is a paradigm? What's a taxonomy? All of these rules are kind of, not rules, words, are related to each other, and yet they all have distinct meanings for us to consider. The theory is the broader based umbrella that provides a framework and generalizations about particular, you know, laws, rules, systems, perspectives. The concept or the concepts are the specific terms within that particular theoretical framework uh, that adds shadow and definition to uh, shades of meanings to the words that are related to uh, that and provides a classification system for our thought processes. A model is a representation of something. You have model trains, you have architectural models, uh, lots of different types of models in the world. <clears throat> Some models are three-dimensional, others are pictorial. They're, they're just a picture model of something. Lots of picture models of the communication process. You know, you could sit down and sketch your own little model of the source, the message, the channel, the receiver, the feedback, uh, you might put noise running across the model that's both internal and external noise and 
a context and the context is within the broader environment. You know, all kinds of sketches of that and basically any uh, freshman level communication, speech communication book that you pick up, the public speaking books and uh, most of the theory books all have some kind of model in there, whether it's a picture or a three-dimensional representation of that. But it's useful to, to stop every once in a while and, and think about, you know, is this a theory or is this just a model? Is this a taxonomy, which is just a list, a list of related concepts, a list of related concepts, a list of related concepts. But it's not a theory. A taxonomy can't predict. Uh, it really usually doesn't even explain. But it's useful because it gives you some labels to put on things that you wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, what's a paradigm? Paradigm is kind of like a theory. It's, it's your broad view of things. It's, it's your way of viewing the world. Is the world flat or is the world round? Does the moon go around the earth? Or does the earth go around the moon? Does the sun go around the earth? Or does the earth go around the sun? So, you know, and those are kind of obvious sorts of things. But, but it all has to do with how we view the world about us and whether we change those paradigms or not. Uh, recent New York Times article addressed how, how print journalism is, while it's still a very viable field, uh, there are fewer consumers, and I've forgotten the number so I won't try to quote it, but, but there are less consumers in that arena now because the paradigm has shifted to the internet. And more people are getting more information off of internet blogs and other uh, sources of news that are on the internet. Our whole, care, our whole paradigm of health care is shifting as, as the country gets older, as more people live longer, uh, there's, there's a different segment of the population needing assistance and so we get a paradigm shift in who the population is. There's a paradigm shift in health care as consumers go to the internet to get information about, and on and on and on, all kinds of paradigm shifts uh, taking place. Even paradigm shifts in political science. Who, who are the bad guys and who are the good guys? You know, and, and which countries do we put on the good guy list and the bad guy list? And not even going there. Okay, but Dewey was interested, whoops, yeah, we're finished with Dewey. Okay, we're moving to Ogden Richards now and we're going to get a little triangle of meaning uh, from them, which is a, a useful model for looking at things. But they are looking at, it, it's called representational theory, and they're looking at how symbols help or hinder us when we're reflecting or thinking about things. And they said there's an indirectness between the relations of words and things, that words mean nothing in themselves. And you've probably heard that little uh, quippy thing from elementary school, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, is that true or not? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Well, it's both true and untrue in the sense that Ogden and Richards are using it. It's true because a word is just a word. And so if my brother calls me pickle face, which he never did, but if he had, I have a choice about how I respond to that. You know, when only when a thinker decides that this is an insult, or down there at the bottom, only when a thinker makes use of, well, let's go back. There's an indirectness between these. The words would be nothing in themselves. When the thinker makes use of them, that's when they mean something. So uh, if if uh, somebody calls me pickle face, or I call someone pickle face, 
It's the interpretation of those symbols that makes the difference. Have I just been insulted? And then I have a secondary choice to make. If I've been insulted, do I want to do anything about it? And of course, the better thing would be if I did nothing about it and just laughed it off or said, you're right. But I'll probably, like most of you, choose to be offended and then pick a behavior after that. But, but the, the important point here is, do the words mean anything? Uh, you may know people who say to you, I love you. Yeah, about that much, you know. Does the person really love you? Love you a whole lot? Do the words mean anything? Or are they just saying stuff? You know, sorry. Yeah, well, that really sounded sorry, didn't it? How sorry are you? Are you so sorry that you will never do it again? That you will be so careful that you make sure that this never happens again? It's, it's not just the tone of voice that you say it in. You know, and again, we'll get to more of this when we get to nonverbal material and paralanguage and vocalics and how we say things. But, but some people are really good at saying it right. Oh, I am so sorry. Yeah, right. I mean, and I may sound really sorry, but if, if my behavior doesn't sustain that, if my actions don't follow from the words, then you're going to know that for you, my words didn't mean anything or they didn't mean very much. So it's how we make use of the words, how we use those words that ultimately makes the difference. Okay, let's look at what is now the uh, relatively famous triangle of meaning. Uh, it's the Ogden Richards Triangle of Meaning. And, and as a general rule, you don't have to remember the name of the theorist in a particular situation, although it's not a bad idea to put it with you. It may help you sort something out or find it if you're looking for it. But I would learn Ogden Richards with Triangle of Meaning because uh, very shortly we're going to have another triangle that comes. We're going to have two more triangles, actually. Theorists seem to like triangles. We're going to have Charles Osgood's uh, semantic space model, and it looks kind of like a triangle. And later on in persuasion theory, we'll get to Leon Festinger, and we'll have a cognitive dissonance model that's triangular in shape. So anything you can do to help you keep those three sorted out is good. Okay, look at this little model. This is a pictorial, a verbal pictorial model. And it has, those arrows are drawn correctly. And those are causal relationships that you see. Be sure you spell that right or note the correct spelling of it. I've had people flip the letters around on exams. Now, sometimes I draw the little model and ask you to label the parts or ask you something that causes you to need to use those words. Anyway, you want to be sure that you do not say casual model or casual relationship. Uh, these are causal relationships between these. At the top of that triangle, you have the thought or reference, and that's what's up there in your head. Uh, we have a symbol like cat, C-A-T, or gato, or I think that's Spanish for cat. Uh, and then you have the object or, or real referent. And the real cat may be a black and white tuxedo kitty. It may be a Siamese cat. Uh, it may be a high white Maine Coon cat. See, even as I give you those choices, I'm using different symbols. And if, if you don't know what a Maine Coon cat is, you're missing something. Uh, they're larger and fluffier and more inquisitive than average, among other things. Uh, but, but that symbol won't mean, if you don't know what tuxedo cat means, then you know well, we've got a, a breakdown there. But if you know those terms, or if I say well, a tiger kitty, you know that should evoke a thought of an orange or orange and white 
cat. Uh, but let's go back to Siamese for a minute. Siamese cat. Uh, you should, that should evoke in your thought processes, in, in your frame of reference, up there in your brain, if you will, uh, what I call the seal point, or most people call the seal point Siamese cat, which is the darker one with the black tip tails and paws and ears and so forth, and those wonderful blue eyes. Uh, or you could think of that cat and, and think, what is the name of that type of Siamese? Oh, it's a seal point Siamese. So there's a two-way causal relationship there. Seal point Siamese should evoke the thought or reference. The thought or reference should evoke the symbol. Now sometimes we get a little brain lag or senior moment or brain cramp or uh, any of a number of other things you might call it. When we have the thought or the reference and we can't get the symbol out as fast as we would like to. Uh, you'll notice on the other side that the causal relationship is one way. The referent produces the thought, but the thought does not produce the referent. You know, you can sit here thinking pizza, pizza, which is probably what the crew is thinking about about now because we've been at this a while. Uh, you know, you, you sit there and, and think the thought and, and it just doesn't make the food appear. You know, whatever it is you're wishing for from hamburger to pizza to steak dinner. Um, and no matter how long you think about it and how much you think about it, how hard you think about it, just thinking about it won't make it happen. So the thought never produces the referent. But the referent produces the thought. It's pretty hard to look at this ballpoint pen and not think ballpoint pen. You know, you don't look at it and think pink cotton candy. Now, as soon as I say pink cotton candy, you probably got a mental image of pink cotton candy because the symbol evoked the thought, but, and, but the pen also evokes the thought. So maybe think about both of them at the same time. But when I picked the pen up, I bet nobody out there looked at this pen and went, oh, she just picked up pink cotton candy because that's not the symbol that goes with this referent. Now, sometimes we don't know which symbol goes with the referent. You know, I've got this little thingy meduji with me today. Okay, now, what is that thing? My flash drive? My USB? And there may be other names for it. I don't know. You know, and, and being of the less technological generation, I sometimes think I'm going to use that thing, but I can't remember what it's called. But I do know how to use it, and I'm very grateful for it. Okay? Uh, but again, it's the case of whether the object produces the thought. Can the thought produce the object? No. Can the symbol produce the thought? Yes. Can the thought produce the symbol? Yes. Well, it can evoke it, at least your voice or brain has to produce it. Okay, now across the bottom of our triangle, if we go back and take another look at it, we'll see it says imputed or arbitra arbitrary relationship. What the heck does that mean? An imputed or arbitrary relationship means that somebody just made up the name for it. You know, whoever was Somebody decided to name this thing, if we go back to the other screen, uh, somebody decided to name this thing a fly, I hope it's called a flash drive. Yeah. Okay, I see somebody nodding their head, yes, good. Okay, you know, why they call it a flash drive? Because you get it on a flash? I don't know, you know. But somebody had to, to decide on things like RAM and, and CD and, DVD and all, all these neat new words that we've had added in the last 10 or 15 years to our vocabulary. Somebody picked those up and, I mean, there's kind of a, a lot of times they're acronyms for something else that accurately describe, but nevertheless, you know, 
just like this computer thing here is called a laptop. I never put it in my lap. Now, I know some people do, and on the airplanes especially. You can, but most people don't put them in their lap. But they decide they're going to call them laptops. Anyway, maybe they thought we would put them in our laps. Okay. But somebody is making up the relationship between the symbol and the referent because you got to call it something in order to be able to talk about it. You know, here's the mouse. Doesn't look like any mouse I ever saw. Okay, enough of that. You get the idea. Okay, these three elements work together to establish meaning. The thought, the symbol, and the referent. And, and out of the various permutations that we just discussed about these, uh, we get meaning. We decide a flash drive is a wonderful thing or not, a mouse is useful or not, we do or do not need the mouse with the laptop, I like it better with than without, you know, on and on. The relationship between the symbol and the object is imputed, the broken line, the other relationships are causal. The symbol doesn't cause the object. The object doesn't cause the symbol. Okay, so those arrows on the model are important and they, they show you which way the causal, not casual, relationships go. Okay, this model also analysis allows us to look at the three general uses of language. We have language that's very scientific <clears throat> over in physics and chemistry and biochemistry and, you know, our sciences. Uh, we have language that's uh, very sophisticated even in advanced uh, technology courses, whether it's computers or production equipment or whatever. The language that communicates description of the referent, you know, even more important then the label flash drive is the language that communicates what goes on inside of there. And I can, I can see those little parts and things inside, but I can't tell you what, I can't even tell you for sure what's going on with the telephone line. You know, I know that the sound is carrying from here to California or New York or whatever, but there are people who really understand the process and who have language and symbols to account for uh, those things. Okay, there's emotional language, language that, like poetry and music that communicates our feelings about particular things. And so we call that emotive language. Sometimes the language that we choose ourselves is emotional rather than uh, concrete. And then there's mixed language, much like the lecture today that fits on the middle range of the continuum. Uh, so for example, if, if you take something like the Mississippi River, which is a referent, and I'm lifting this example from one of my professors, but that's the way life goes. Uh, a scientific statement might, and I probably don't have the, the numbers right, but the Mississippi River at Baton Rouge is 5,321 feet wide. I don't know if it's a mile wide or not. But it would be emotive language if, if you went to something like the old song that said, you know, old man river, that old man river, he just keeps moving along. And most of you probably never heard that song either. But, you know, we know there's some gray hair up here. Okay. But emotional language, the, like the music lyrics, uh, all our dying heart country western stuff is good uh, as examples for emotional language. <clears throat> and the scientific language is more precise and uh, uh, is used in more descriptive reference. Okay, let's look at one more theorist today, and, and that will be Osgood, and that will help you uh, get these little triangles straight, maybe. <laughs> okay, I like Osgood. Well, I like Ogden and Richards, too. Of course, I like most of these people, or we wouldn't be talking about them. 
or about their theories. Osgood was trying to define and therefore measure the behaviors that people elicited with sign stimuli. You know, we said you see a stop sign, you react in a particular way. And he recognized that our overt behavior, our external behavior, is mediated by internal responses. You know, how do you act when you go to the dentist, for example? Uh, well, you have learned internal responses, uh, and these are associated with other stimuli, and so you get all these things tangled up together. Uh, research has shown, for example, that that smell that you get at the dentist office is one of the most hated smells in America. The, I don't know if it's the smell of the glue when they glue the crowns on or whatever, but uh, you know, most people are not, unless they're just going in for a routine cleaning and even that's scary because they may find something. But uh, our overt behavior, the way we actually act, is affected by these internal responses and we've learned these. So ask yourself, you know, what kind of responses do you have to cobra snake, the moon, grass, and I'm talking about the green stuff you walk in, not what none of you would ever smoke. Okay, well, I finally got a chuckle out of my camera, man. That's good <laughs> all this time. Okay, language is the product of the interaction between ideas and speech. So, uh, you know, Anybody want to play with a cobra snake? I don't think so. You know, do you think the, do you like the moon? I'm very fond of it. I'll go, you know, if, if I see, I'll say, oh, look, there's the moon. You know, pretty full moon tonight. I, I like it. Other people go, yeah, the moon's out. Okay. And we'll save grass for later. Okay. Osgood said that there are three dimensions along which we all rate things. Evaluation, activity, and potency. <clears throat> uh, the activity, obviously, it's either active or inactive. Potency, it's either strong or it's weak. And evaluation, it's either good or it's bad. So, how would you rate cobra snakes? Well, we've done this in live sections of the class before. Most people rate them pretty high on active, pretty high on strong, and kind of toward the negative are bad on the evaluation level. Of course, if you make your living making, you know, blowing a instrument and making the snake dance, well, you probably have a higher opinion of them. But view this as a three-dimensional space. And, and that space is up there in your brain. So go to the moon, for example. Well, don't literally go to the moon, but think about the moon. Is it active or inactive? And some people, and this is a good one because we differ. Act, some people say that it's uh, inactive because it's just sitting up there going around in orbit. Other people say that it's very active because it influences the tides. Is it good or bad? Most of us agree it's good because we think it's pretty, but some people say it's bad because it's just this kind of like a piece of space junk up there floating around and we haven't found any good use for it and, you know, we're not drilling it up and hauling it back home. Uh, is it weak or strong? Is it active? Well, I, I don't know what I said a minute ago, but anyway, it's strong because it influences the tides. That strong weak. Active, inactive, almost everybody agrees it's inactive because it's not doing anything. I may have misstated the first part of that. If so, ignore it. Okay, so if you think the moon is good, inactive, and strong, you're going to place it, uh, go back to me, Mr. Camera Guy. Okay, you're going to place, thank you, you're going to place it out here in one spot, but if you think that the moon is good, not very strong, maybe even weak and inactive, you're going to place it in another space. So then when we get to people and say, is this person good or bad, strong, you know, how do we rate them? I may put a person over here, you'll put that person over somewhere else, somebody else who sees another side of them, and, and remember this space is all up there in our head. And, and so then when we place people differently in our semantic space, uh, we're disagreeing about our assumptions on that particular symbol. 
uh, he said that we assign meanings. You know, most of these things I've been talking about, uh, we don't have any direct experience with. Anybody played with a cobra snake lately? Probably not. Any of you been dead and come back? Don't tell me. You know, I lost some quote marks on the moon. I wonder where they went. Uh, <clears throat> you know, moon, we haven't been there, although some people have. But we have opinions about things, and, and we assign meanings to these things based on what we've learned indirectly from other people. Now, Osgood developed the semantic differential, and this is a meaning measurement tool. It's really great for quantitative uh, research, and, and we'll get into quantitative versus qualitative in the next lecture. But uh, you've probably taken those scales where you evaluate things from very strongly agree to very strongly disagree, and you go through and respond to all kinds of items. Or you take a, uh, you may do a profile on a political candidate and say, is this person, you know, either a five-point or seven-point scale, is this person experienced or inexperienced, competent, incompetent, trustworthy, uh, untrustworthy, on and on, charismatic, not charismatic, and those kinds of things. And, and so you rate those items and then the people doing the scoring can come up with a profile of an audience. And they might say, people in Florida see it this way, people in California see it that way, and on and on. Well, Osgood said, you know, he developed the tool, he gets credit for that. It's a research methodology tool, uh, like Dramatistic Pinted, but it, it's a quantitative pool. C tool, not pool, tool. <laughs> it's time to go home. You're probably ready to turn this off, and we will soon. Okay, the important thing is Osgood said these factors apply across all people and all cultures. The factors apply across all people and all cultures of evaluation, potency, and activity. And while we may place them differently, we will still use those three factors. Let's hold that thought for today and see you next time.